20 years after the M40 school minibus tragedy, have the lessons been learned? As Lester waits to hear whether it's going to be named City of Culture, we consider the long-term merits of the title. And a familiar face delivers Shakespeare to the classroom. It's 20 years since the M40 school minibus tragedy. Are children any safer? Join us in a moment. Hello and welcome to ITV News Central, tonight's top stories. The minibus crash 20 years ago that killed 12 children. Parents say the law today is still lax. The lessons that should have been learned from the accident don't appear to have been learned. A court hears how a businessman accused of killing a family of four told officials he just went crazy upon his arrest. The six-goal thriller with a last-minute penalty and the manager squaring up post-match. And how the Bard's work is being brought to life in the classroom. Good evening. A private memorial service has been held for 12 children and their teacher who died in a minibus crash on the M40 20 years ago today. The accident stunned the village in Worcestershire where they went to school. The Department of Transport says safety laws were changed after the crash. But two decades on, the parents of one of the pupils who died say too little has been done to prevent a similar accident. They say children's safety is still being treated like a game of roulette. Wesley Smith reports. These young pupils had so looked forward to their trip to a concert at the Royal Albert Hall. No one could have imagined that they would never come home to tell their families all about it. On the evening of the 18th of November 1993, their minibus crashed into the back of a highway maintenance truck and burst into flames. It was a scene that shocked even the most experienced of emergency crews. Fellow pupils and staff at Hagley Roman Catholic High School faced many months of heartache as they tried to understand what had happened. But parents like Liz and Steve Fitzgerald live with the memory of what happened to their daughter Claire every day. Day to day, there are people who have supported us on our journey on our last 20 years. And I think without those, we would be seriously struggling. Uh, there are people who've walked alongside us, who've held us up. It's been a difficult journey. We do have fun and we get on with it, but it is not the way it should have been. The inquest heard it was most likely the teacher, Eleanor Fry, who was driving and also died, fell asleep at the wheel after a long day. The M40 was a new motorway and the services were still under construction at the time, so little opportunity to take a break. Although that has been rectified along with seatbelt laws, there's still no special driving test for anyone at the wheel of private minibuses with up to 16 seats. We have been 20 years wondering why the lessons that should have been learned from the accident don't appear to have been learned. Why young people today are being driven um, in a roulette game. It's different for commercial operators who must meet strict guidelines, even though some of their vehicles may appear a little different to some school minibuses. The PSV driver has to go through su such a strict regime to gain his qualification. And, th and this two-tier licensing system is, is, is not acceptable. And uh, I'm sure that many, many, 99% of parents are unaware of their vulnerable children and vulnerable adults that are being carried in this way with no professional qualifications. The parents whose children died are being supported by the charity BUSC. They say what is in effect a two-tier system for volunteers and professionals is a nonsense. We're very determined. BUSC is always set out to win a battle if it picks one up and yeah we're going to battle right through until we do win. There's no you know half measures here and bring in a proper system to safeguard children. We didn't want to do this, but after 20 years of nothing happening, we just felt we had to. 
There are still 17 people at Hagley Catholic High School who were staff or students at the time. A special mass was held earlier to remember those who died. Liz and Steve Fitzgerald will never forget Claire, nor will they settle until they see the law change to minimise the risk of such a tragedy ever happening again. Wesley Smith, ITV News. Well, elsewhere, the family of a car crash victim from Warwickshire is backing a new campaign to get drivers to keep their eyes fully on the road. Paul Collins died when a motorist pulled into his path as he was riding his motorbike. The road safety charity Brake says drivers who try to multitask while at the wheel are putting lives at risk. It's calling on mobile phone users to turn them off or put them in the boot when they're driving. Our correspondent Peter Bean reports. It's left a huge hole in our life. It, he was just everything to us. Paul Collins' family are facing their third Christmas without him. He was killed as he rode his motorbike near Stratford-upon-Avon in Warwickshire. A car turned across the road in front of him. The driver told police he didn't see Mr Collins, who died almost instantly. You're driving a vehicle that is very dangerous if you aren't concentrating properly. I think before you get in a car, what you're driving really, because it's a machine that in some cases just leaves you devastated like like we all are. Oh, that's the same. The M6 in the West Midlands, and police are on the lookout for drivers not giving the road their full attention. Yeah, so the lorry that's now behind us, uh, the driver's got a, a black mug in his right hand, his hand's resting on the wheel, so he's not in proper control of his vehicle. They pull over the driver, who's been having a swig of coffee at the wheel. I think I'm, I'm in total control of it, the vehicle with, with one hand. People drive a car with one hand, so. But obviously it's an offence and it's punishable. He's given a caution before being allowed on his way. It's thought motorists who multitask, like using their phone while driving, are up to three times more likely to crash. New figures show there are more than 35,000 drivers in the West Midlands with points on their licence for such offences. Some are now calling for hands-free phone kits to be banned as well as handheld ones and stiffer penalties for offenders. Even if you have your phone, say, just on vibrate and you're driving along, if someone calls you, you might still feel the vibration in your pocket. You might still have that temptation uh, to answer that call. So what we're calling for is really clear. We ask that all drivers just keep the phone switched off, out of sight and out of mind. For many today, their phone is their life. The message from campaigners, using it at the wheel, could cost a life. Peter Bean, ITV News. The jury in the case of a businessman from Coventry accused of murdering a family of four has begun hearing the defence argument. Ang Zhang Du fled to Morocco after university lecturer Jifeng Ding, his wife and two daughters were found stabbed to death at their home in 2011. Du is accused of killing them after losing a 10-year legal battle. Our reporter Russell Hookie was in court. Arriving at court this morning, Helen Ding's father and brother with their interpreter for day one of the defence argument in the case of Ang Zhang Du, the man accused of killing Mrs Ding, her husband Jeff and their two children. Representing Mr Du, Rebecca Trowler QC, called two witnesses. The first, Mr Anthony Keating, a solicitor from Birmingham, who represented Ang Zhang Du and his wife in his long-running legal battle with the Dings at the High Court. He said that during that legal battle he'd always found Ang Zhang Du perfectly reasonable and it had been Ang Zhang Du who wanted to resolve the battle as quickly as possible but his wife had wanted to continue the fight with the Dings. We also heard via video link from Morocco uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office worker Leighton Williams who's pro-consul for Morocco. It's his job to look after British nationals in that country who find themselves arrested. He said he'd visited Ang Zhang Du in prison after hearing of his arrest and talked to him for around an hour and a half. During that time he said he appeared uh, confused, sometimes upset, uh, occasionally tearful. And during that discussion Ang Zhang Du had mentioned the legal battle with a friend which had been ongoing for a number of years. He said at the conclusion of that legal battle he'd lost everything and he'd made a last ditch attempt to resolve it by going to the friend's house. Uh, unfortunately the friend had laughed in his face. He said at that moment he'd gone crazy and gesticulated with his right hand. 
Mr Williams says he didn't pursue his questioning after that as Ang Xiang Du became too upset. But he told the court Mr Du had told him he'd wished he'd never moved from China to the UK and that his parting words at their meeting were, help me God. Ang Xiang Du denies murder, although it's not disputed that he killed the family at their home in Wooten on April the 29th, 2011. The case will continue tomorrow. Russell Hookie, ITV News, Northampton. A stem cell donor campaign backed by the parents of a seriously ill boy from the black country has been credited with boosting the number of Asian volunteers. Two-year-old Gaurav Baines from Tipton has a rare immune condition and needs a bone marrow transplant before Christmas. Following awareness campaigns over the past two months, the Anthony Nolan Bone Marrow Trust say they've seen 500 potential donors come forward. That's compared to just 40 volunteers in the same period last year. Sections of the motorway and a major A road in Worcestershire were closed for nearly 27 hours this weekend as a man threatened to harm himself on a bridge over the M42. These were the scenes on the motorway and the A38 and surrounding roads as traffic built up. Many motorists took to social media to vent their frustrations at the delays. Well, this has led to criticism from mental health charities who have called some of the tweets inappropriate. For more on this, we're joined by Helen Wadley, who's chief executive of the Birmingham branch of mental health charity Mind. Uh, Helen Wadley, inappropriate is a, a kind way of putting it. Actually, some of these tweets were downright cruel. Mm. Are you surprised? I'm saddened um, that people, you know, in response to such a distressing incident actually could, you know, put those, that level of anger and frustration. Um, the man was obviously, you know, experiencing a high amount of distress. Helen, do you think people have too ready access to social media, just too easy to go mm. online or onto Twitter and say these things? I think people can find it very easy to hide behind the anonymity of social media. So I think sometimes people just don't think about what they say as well. It's just this sort of almost instant reaction that they're feeling frustrated because they're stuck in a traffic jam and then they vent that frustration out without really thinking about it. That's what I would hope anyway. So they almost need treatment themselves. Well, I think it I think it would help for them to have a better understanding about what emotional health is about, what mental health is about and, you know, how low some people can feel. And how do you get that message through? A variety of ways. The media obviously plays a, a huge role in um, trying to portray a positive message around mental health and mental promotion. Um, just simple things like, you know, encouraging people to talk to each other and actually be open about their feelings and the difficulties that they're having. Can something positive come out of this very sad incident when so many people were really saying just the wrong thing? Mm. I, I've been really heartened actually by the backlash against the negative comments. Um, I think the police were great in terms of their response back to it. Um, and certainly some of the tweets that I've seen more recently, they have actually been people talking about their own suicidal experiences or, you know, sort of the death of a close friend, etc. And being much, much more positive and also doing sort of the backlash against the people who made the initial negative tweets. So I think something has positive, something positive has come from it. Well, thanks very much, Helen. And we should mention that uh, details of mind are on our website. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Still to come here on ITV News Central, why the Bard is being beamed into the classroom. In less than 36 hours, Leicester will know if it's been chosen to be UK City of Culture for 2017. It's up against three rivals, but the Leicester team insists they're confident of success. Well, the bill for the year-long celebration is likely to top £10 million, some of which could end up being paid by the City Council. So, would it be public money well spent? Andy Bevan has this special report. If November in Leicester started with a bang, it could end with an explosion of celebration or go out like a soggy sparkler. The announcement of the next UK City of Culture will be made early on Wednesday morning on live TV, watched back home by four cities, each vying for the chance to show the country and the world that they are the place to be in 2017. 
Leicester's final bid was sent on its way by local band Kasabian at the end of September. It's certain to big up the city's multicultural mix, its annual carnivals and festivals, and its arts and entertainment venues. But being a city of culture doesn't come cheap. Estimates put the cost of staging a year of events at between 10 and 12 million pounds. The City Council will try to raise that money from private investment and sponsorship, but they've pledged to make up any shortfall from public funds. The rate of return on that £10 million is being estimated already as being somewhere between four and eight times the amount that's put in. So if you consider it in those terms, I think as part of the regeneration of a city like Leicester, it's, it's absolutely fundamental and it's really important that that investment continues. Financial returns for this year's title holder, Northern Ireland's Derry Londonderry, aren't in yet as events there are still underway. But Liverpool, which was European capital of culture in 2008, totted up an estimated £800 million in economic benefits, especially in leisure and tourism. Leicester's economy, though, isn't about occasional visitors to hotels, restaurants and theatres. Most businesses here rely on regular local customers. 33-year-old Alex Salter set up this grooming salon three and a half years ago. He's ploughed profits back into the premises and it now operates on four floors, with hairdressing for men and women on two floors, beauty treatments on a third and a tattoo studio on the top floor. Alex says a win could prompt him to expand his business, but says the City Council needs to look beyond 2017. It needs to be something that has longevity. Um, it's obviously hopefully going to um, create opportunities for, for jobs and for people around here, and it can't be here, here today, gone tomorrow kind of things. Half a mile from that city centre salon, though, some Leicester folk are less than enthusiastic about becoming a city of culture. This is the St Matthew's Estate, one of the most socially deprived areas in the country. Some residents we spoke to here hadn't even heard about the bid, and those that have say the council's underwriting of 10 to 12 million pounds for a year-long jamboree could be far better allocated. Jobs are being cut, bedroom tax come in, they're looking around for food, the estate is nearly 60 years old. We need the money there to improve the better life of Leicester kids their future, basically, than having that money spent on other stuff. There are some in the city who argue that culturally, even multiculturally, Leicester has got too much going for it to win, and the prize will be awarded to one of its three rivals, which may benefit more. In Scotland, Dundee's Contemporary Arts Centre will join a brand new V&A design building on the waterfront to consolidate its bid. Hull's annual Freedom Festival is at the centre of its plans, coupled with attractions like the Maritime Museum and the Deep Aquarium. And Swansea Bay's campaign includes events in the newly restored Hayford Copper Works, plus a scheme to reintroduce the Mumbles train. The discovery of the remains of King Richard III under a council car park has already given Leicester a taste of national and international attention. You could say the city sees him as something of a crowning glory for its bid. But... Is it enough? What we've seen with Richard III is a significant increase in hotel occupancy, but also the profile of Leicester right across the world. City of Culture will be a vehicle for us to be able to raise that profile even further. We'll find out the day after tomorrow if Leicester is to be City of Culture in 2017. But even if it wins, it may be many more years before we discover whether its legacy lived on or became as forgotten as its medieval monarch. Andy Bevan, ITV News. Well, it'd be a shame if it didn't get it because it's got too much going for it. Mm. The national and international news is a few moments away. Alistair Stewart has the headlines. A step forward in blocking the search for child abuse on the internet as Google and Microsoft come on board. But fears tonight online predators will still find what they want in their own secret cyber world. From the Philippines, how a church crypt offers the only hope for a family still taking refuge from the aftermath of the typhoon. And here, the safety campaigners who say all mobile telephony, even hands-free, should be banned from Britain's roads. Join Mary Nightingale and me at 6.30. Still ahead here on ITV News Central, how Doctor Who is helping bring the Bard's work to life in the classroom. But first, here's Steve with the sports. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know if I can do better than Doctor Who. I'll see what I can. Uh, there's football, rugby and boxing all on the way.
ITV Central Sports Report, sponsored by WeWantAnyCar.com, the Cash for Cars website. And there's victories for Port Vale, Cheltenham and Wolves to come. But we start with an extraordinary match for Coventry. Away at Bradford, the match swung one way and then another before Coventry finally looked to have sealed a win when, well, let's just have a look. Sometimes it can all seem just too easy and in form Coventry must have had that feeling as Andy Webster fired them ahead at Bradford after less than two minutes. Just another five pass before it was 2-0, Leon Clark slotting into an empty net. But the home team finally came alive in the 17th minute, out by an almost unbelievable series of defensive errors, Nucky Wells making the most of Coventry's confusion. And he single-handedly continued the fight back as Coventry's lead was wiped out in the 28th. The Sky Blues continued to play with intent though, and Callum Wilson, who'd scored with an easy tap-in a week earlier, reminded everyone what he's really all about. And it stayed 3-2 until beyond the 90th minute and into the 94th, the referee awarding Bradford a penalty for handball. And who else but Wells stepped up for the kick. He completed a hat-trick, Coventry just taking a point when it was so nearly three. Wolves are top of League One after victory at Notts County. Ethan Ebanks Landell with the goal. Wolves unbeaten in 11 and a point clear of Leighton Orient. Port Vale have now won five of their last four games. Chris Robertson headed in the first against Midlands rival Shrewsbury. Jenison Myrie Williams' dipping shot made it 2 0 in the 30th. In the second half, Liam McAlinden pulled one back for the visitors. But this was Vale's day. As the Shrews pushed for an equaliser, Jordan Huggle found space at the other end to score his first league goal. After a shock defeat in the FA Cup to non-league Tamworth, Cheltenham are back to winning ways. Jimmy Curriton with the first at Wickham. The home side levelled through Matt McClure in the 66th minute. But just a minute later, Cheltenham sealed the win when Billy Knott deflected a cross into his own net. After three straight wins, defeat at Dagenham and Redbridge marked back-to-back -back defeats for Burton. Phil Edwards brought down Zavon Hines, the striker stepped up for the kick and made it 1-0. In the second half, the home side got another, Luke Howell ensuring Burton left empty-handed. Disappointing for Burton. Now on to rugby, and Worcester just missed out on a second win of the season at home to Leicester Tigers. The first quarter of the match saw Worcester dominating and scoring two tries. But visiting Leicester, who had 20 players out through international commitments and injuries, came back in the second half with a try from Michael Noon and a late penalty try, leaving Worcester to count the cost of five missed kicks at goal. A Birmingham boxing trainer Rob McCracken has spoken of his disappointment at the news that former world heavyweight champion David Hay could be forced to retire due to a shoulder injury. Well, McCracken was with his most successful fighter, Carl Frotch, who was giving an open training session ahead of his world title defence with George Groves this Saturday. I'm a big fan of David Hay. I think he's been a fantastic fighter. Hopefully he won't be retiring, but um, he's been brilliant for British boxing. He's a friend of mine and he's a, he's a good friend of Carl's. And um, I was looking forward to his fight with Tyson Fury. Fury's a tremendous prospect and Hay's a tremendous uh, elite fighter. So that would have been fantastic. But... Um, yeah, it's just a, a real shame to hear that he's got such an injury, but good luck to him and we wish him the best thing whatever he does. It's all your spot from me. Thank you, Steve. How's Carl Frotch doing? I know you've done yeah. lots of filming with him, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously, we were, we were looking at Robert Kraken's thoughts and David Hay then. My, my best wishes to David. But yes, Carl's in great shape. He's 11 years older than his opponent this coming Saturday, but he's really up for it. Hopefully, experience will pay off. I must just also say, by the way, good luck to, uh, to Walsall because they're playing Peterborough tonight, so a game for them. That's great. Thanks, Steve. Now, the works of William Shakespeare have long been a key part of the national curriculum in schools, with thousands of students tackling the Bard's plays every year. Gone are the days, though, of simply reading parts out in class because now the performances themselves are being broadcast directly into classrooms for the first time. Chris Halpin's been brushing up on his Shakespeare with a bit of help. Drinking my briefs whilst you mount up on... This is Shakespeare's Richard II, like students have never seen it before. 
This live recording is being shown simultaneously to more than 30,000 pupils across the country, all part of a project by the Royal Shakespeare Company to bring the Bard's words to life. Rather than just reading the text around the class and discussing it as we might have done a few years ago, we've really been encouraged and empowered to, to turn the classroom into a stage and uh, act through what Shakespeare was, was trying to tell us all those hundreds of years ago. With my own breath, release all duteous oaths. One way to bring things up to date is through cunning casting. And although the star of this first live show, David Tennant, is well used to treading the boards at the RSC, the pupils see him more as a doctor than a king. In Doctor Who, he's like less serious and less his historical kind of thing, but it's really encouraging for us because it's something we enjoy. I understand it a bit more than I used to because it's really clear on what they're saying. Some of the words are like different types of English, so it's better to have actually someone acting it out. Doctor Who is as popular at this school as any other school up and down the country, and so having that familiar face um, definitely helped sell the, um, the play and the watching of the play to the students. More than 460 schools took advantage of Richard II's first live broadcast from the home of the RSC in Shakespeare's birthplace, Stratford-upon-Avon. But the theatre wants to make its work even more accessible. We know that for many schools across the country it's going to be impossible uh, to take the risk of coming to Stratford. So first, let's take our work into your classroom so that you can prove to yourself that students can be engaged and excited by that work. And over the next six years, schools can choose from 18 more productions from the Royal Shakespeare Company, beam straight into classrooms, replacing the page with the projector. Chris Halpin, ITV News. That's such a good idea, bringing Shakespeare to life. And I can't mm. believe that you haven't at some time been on the stage with a Shakespeare play. Well, I don't know. It's an awful long time ago. I was about 10 at the time and I was in Midsummer Night's Dream. I played Puck. Puck, right. Robin Goodfellow. Yeah. Were you good at it? No. And I didn't understand a word of it, really. But I, I appreciate it now, of course. As There's so much yeah. more to learn. Yeah. But now, for a look at the weather forecast today, here's Becky Menton. It could be cool in Birmingham, but somewhere in the world, the sun is shining. ITV Central Weather, sponsored by Turkish Airlines. Hello again, a very good evening to you. I hope you had a lovely start to the new week, despite the fact that it's been pretty miserable from a weather point of view. Today's cloud and rain is going to continue to clear overnight tonight, but it's looking cold for all of us for the rest of the week. So here's what's going on. You can see a frontal system clearing south and eastwards across the UK. It's going to leave clearing skies for most of us overnight tonight and beautiful conditions on the cards for tomorrow. But still a few showers speckled in there and any of those showers could turn rather wintry, particularly across the higher ground. So looking ahead to tonight in more detail, you can see it's a largely dry, fairly clear sort of picture. But again, the risk of wintry showers in places and with temperatures as low as these, we can expect a widespread frost. A beautiful start to the day is on the cards for tomorrow. Almost wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. Very chilly indeed, though. Leave yourself some extra time to defrost the car in the morning. Very little changes into the afternoon. Still more of the same. Lots of sunshine around. Largely dry, but really feeling very chilly indeed. And then looking ahead to the rest of the week. It's rather wet, I'm afraid, for Wednesday. But Thursday and Friday, looking largely dry. Some good spells of brightness. But as I say, continuing very chilly for everyone. Have a lovely evening. See you later. ITV Central Weather, sponsored by Turkish Airlines. And there's just time to remind you of our top stories here on ITV News Central. A private memorial service has been held for 12 children and their teacher from Worcestershire who died in a minibus crash on the M40 20 years ago today. The parents of one of the pupils say too little has been done to prevent it all happening again. The family of a car crash victim from Warwickshire are backing a new campaign to get drivers to concentrate fully on the road, not to multitask. Paul Collins died when the motorist pulled into his path as he was riding his motorbike. And a court has heard how a Coventry businessman accused of killing a family of four told officials he went crazy when he was arrested. The prosecution claims Ang Zhang Du murdered the Ding family in revenge after he lost a legal battle with them. He denies all the charges. 
And for more on all our stories today, you can head to our website and there you'll find the Derbyshire Tights Company with some rather big celebrity clients. That's itv.com forward slash central. Celebrity clients. Well, I'm with a celebrity tonight. Thank you for so. having me on your sofa, Bob. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure. I hope you join us again. And I hope you'll join us again at six o'clock tomorrow night. Bye-bye for now.